ebusia ya ma kwa ba shonko so eba p o g media ene yare meko highway ne so highway ne die ensem bebre wo so a ye nso ya je pene se ye be me ya bi dafo no ahu die e ko ene die e ba na den na e ko so e wo highway ne so e ye anko kwesi prat ena e de ensem bebre aba be tuja ne ensem na o de be tuja no enye asem ketu akwa na Praise ya o praise jin na na o poku ajimano. Enye praise in kitu wasi masa. Mami weine o ba. O ba bi di John Dramani. Mahama echi. Neche se. O mo de gana. Akwa ku jina bebi ya eye se jina. Na mame no. Onte se bagu miya. O ye o de entro. Ene ye ne jumano. O ye ubi ya. O no no. O sa anso ne criminals. Fo ne ye den. E nam. Na sa mami weye ka. Sa mame ne unkwa de ya. O no no. Enka obedi NDC for a china or ne or mono. I can pin it to NPP a man you call now. And yet as I'm get to a cry to know. What's the brat? Then some more day at two janano. What he can't send me brie. A sound watch say NPP a man you call baby or more funny day. A year opposition and all my day or more call. Yabe pe say yabe me abu ya forno. Bemi ako na ya kwa kuti and sama el koso el high winners na. Ansa ane ebe kono. Owo, ensa mke ebi afa she ye comment section like na she ma afo fron so ensa into me. Enke ebi aha, eye pi OG Media. Bene mase. Well, when you find a situation in which people who support an 80 year old president begin to raise issues about a 71, 72, 73 year old vice presidential candidate, then that's a problem. And the problem is reductible only to male chauvinism. And male chauvinism, in essence, is anti-woman. I think at that point it has to be made quite clearly. You understand? I was really surprised, you know, over the last two days and so on, I heard people make comments to the effect that wh whoever has been selected as running mate for the National Democratic Congress is problematic because the person who has been selected it's a 73-year-old menopausal woman. That's a display of extreme backwardness. And beyond being a display of extreme backwardness and, and, and the height of male chauvinism and so on, it is also anti-development to the extent that we live in a country in which 52% of the total national population is made up of women. The denial of women's right to participate in the national development effort is clearly anti-development. And we need to recognize that. So if you listen to people, if you listen to constituencies, if you listen to political parties and so on, what they say betrays who they truly are. And the debate about the outdooring of Professor J. Nana Opoku Ajima has given us the opportunity to see the different constituencies, and I'm not talking about uh, Ayawasu West and so on, I'm talking about different constituencies, and how these different constituencies react to the gender question they react to the development model and so on. I mean, it, it's so very revealing for me, and, and I think that it is good that it is revealing. The other thing I'd like to talk about is just the splendor. I mean, many events have happened at the venue before and so on. I was not there. I watched on television. And the splendor was remarkable. The arrangement, the choreography, and so on. 
I don't know who was responsible for that. But whoever was responsible for that deserves tons of commendation because it added to it all. You know, the, the arrangements, the everything came up so very nicely. Now, I would, in all honesty, consider Chairman Asid Nketiah's statement as a down. I do not disagree with him. The clamor for positions is, is irrational. And I said here yeah, before he said what he said, you remember that people were beginning to count their chickens before they are hatched. You remember? So, so in essence, there is some merit in what he said. The problem is the occasion. Wrong platform. Wrong occasion. This is the outdooring of the vice presidential candidate. People want to see or hear what she has in store. What kind of a vice presidential candidate is she going to be and so on. Is this the moment to stand up and look Ghanaians in the face and say, hey, my people, instead of even preparing to win elections, they've started fighting for positions as well. It's a down. It was a wrong occasion. When I heard it, I cringed. That is not the place for this kind of talk. What he said may be a true observation. I agree with him that this clamoring for positions and so on, it, 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 it's nauseating. I agree with him. But I would have thought eh, that a better occasion would have been an inner party discussion. Not on a platform like this. Inner party discussion. And in fact, as national chairman of the party, he ought to be able to put in place mechanisms to prevent this madness that is wearing its, 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 its head within the party. And sometimes it finds expression in the media. And I wonder what it is intended to achieve. So that's one of the downs that I saw with this otherwise splendid, you know, ceremony. Now I've heard many people say that, oh, this is a different Nana Opoku Ajimai. We've never seen her like that and so on. Well, for those of us who have known her over a very long period of time, this is the real Professor Nana Opoku Ajimai. And I've been talking about what first impressed me about her. And it was when she delivered the first Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Lectures in the University of Cape Coast. And I sat in the audience and I said, this woman has something. The brilliance, the articulation, the eloquence, even to some extent, you may be tempted to say visionary. And I'm very cautious about how I use my words, and that's why I'm saying that even to some extent, you may be tempted to see her as a visionary. She was in total command of the space. No doubt at all, she was in total command of the space. She was the centerpiece of the ceremony. No doubt at all about it. Okay? Her diction was, was perfect. And I'm not surprised people refer to her as a literature professor. The diction was carefully selected and it made the right impact. I believe that her description of the current situation was apt. You understand? And indeed, some of the people in the crowd should have been ashamed of themselves listening to her. 
Because one of the things that she did which, which impressed me most was this uh, attack on tribalism. Some people call it ethnocentricity. That is dignifying it. It is pure, raw, tribalistic nonsense. And it is continuing even today. If you want to choose somebody, she has to be Ashanti. She has to come from Northern region. She has to be this and that. This is Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana. And she attacked it in a manner which was perfect. So ethnicity has now been, been, been elevated. elevated to the level of intellectualism. Masa, do you know why it has been raised to the level of intellectualism? Because the people who do it, they think they are doing science. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? If you hear them, oh, uh, the stronghold of the MPP is in the Ashanti region. This is the number of goals they got, got in 20, 20 something and something. So if you don't select an Ashanti, you lose. I mean, they clothe it as if it is science. It is not science. It is pure tribalistic nonsense. And there's a lot of that. First of all, in the campaign against John Mahama. And there was a lot of that in, in, in the juggling for selection of somebody as running mate. And I heard somebody actually, big man in the party and so on, say, look, the voter region is our stronghold, so we have to select the running mate from the voter region. All kinds of, of reasons, childish reasons and so on, you understand? Now, Masa, Ghana is not hmm, an island in the world and so on. Ghana is part of the global community. That's what I'm saying. Ghana is part of the global community. In Poland, in Poland, two brothers, one was the president and one was the prime minister. They were all elected by the Polish people. The fact of their being brothers did not detract to their history of struggle and their, their perceived commitment to the nation. A brother, two brothers, one president, one prime minister in Poland. Hmm? In Cuba, who replaced Fidel? A brother. Raul, his brother. The Cubans had no problems with that. And they had no problems with that because both Fidel and Raul were in the Syria Meister. They fought together to liberate Cuba from the tentacles of U.S. hegemony and build a new Cuba which had the best educational system in the world, which had the best healthcare system in the world. The fact of their being brothers did not matter. In Nicaragua, Nicaragua is even, I mean, that's out of this world. The president's wife is the vice president in Nicaragua. And I can go on and on and on and on. Now, the people who, 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 who were playing this tribal politics and so on, you will be surprised. Some of them actually admire the system of monarchy in Britain. What is that system? The bloodline determines who becomes head of state. They have no problem with that. They admire that. But here, they are engaged in, 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 in tribal politics. You know, and so on. Now, I, I get sick. So sometimes I ask myself, all of these things, election of president, selection of vice president, and so on, what is the purpose? Because if you focus on the purpose, 
you would not make some of these silly statements that are being made all over the place. Focus on the purpose. What is the purpose? One, simple, to make sure that all of our 32 million people have access to portable water. So the people are not infected with guinea worm and so on. That's a purpose. Hmm? Two, to make sure that people have access to decent housing. Three, to improve national infrastructure so that when the poor farmer grows his cassava in the rural community, that cassava can, move, can be moved to the buying center. So that the cassava does not rot on the farm. You understand what I'm saying? What is the purpose? The purpose is to improve access to quality education. Not just to improve access to education, but to improve access to quality education. Okay? What is the purpose? The purpose of all of this are politicking. The purpose of what we are going to do on December 7, 2024 is to make sure that when we fall sick, we can get appropriate treatment to make sure that we do not even fall sick too many times. We can prevent falling sick. Now, if this is the purpose, does it matter whether the running mate is an Ashanti, is a Dagomba, is a Fafra, or comes of Gomua Francy. Does it matter? Masa, does it matter? If this is the purpose, does it matter whether all the people in government, from president to the sweeper in the minister's office, are Fafras? I am keenly aware of the constitutional injunction to provide a certain balance in appointing public appointments and so on. I'm keenly aware of that constitutional injunction. And I believe so very firmly that we need to respect the constitution for whatever it is worth and so on. But we should not take our eyes off the objectives of politics and governance. Because we will lose it. That is why today, there are so many people in political office, and when you see them, you say, hey, is this how far we have come? No entities, empty heads, vagabonds, all kinds of people in political office. How did they get there? Because of this stupid notion of achieving a certain balance. It doesn't matter the quality. I have heard, is it the fortune or misfortune? I'm not sure. But I've heard, whatever it is, fortune or misfortune, of being close to most of the people who have become president in this country. And I've had lengthy conversations with them about their visions and so on. And one of the issues that I have discussed with them many times is that the sheer numbers of, of, of people who are appointed into public service, 100 ministers, 90 ministers, 80 ministers, and so on. And they will all tell you that the difficulty is in achieving the balance. The balance with the con Constitution injuncts them to achieve. So he's made his ministerial appointments, and he sees that what? One particular region is underrepresented. So to, to, to achieve the balance, you know what they do? They appoint ministers and assign them to the Flagstaff House. They have no portfolio, nothing to do, just to achieve a certain balance. Masa. The last time I heard, the Ministry of Finance was actually boasting that 
that the rate of inflation is going to come down to 25 point something percent. You understand? That's what the Minister of Finance was boasting about. Quite high. Higher than what they met when they came into office. Of course, we went very, very high. Hmm. Now we are climbing down. We are, we are coming to about 25 percent at all. Now the question I ask, if you appoint hmm, a vice presidential candidate from Gumwa Apa, how does that bring down the rate of inflation? This country is bankrupt. I hear the figures have changed. The last time I looked at the figures, or I was, I was made aware of the figures, we were spending 128% of total national revenue on three line items. Debt repayment, debt servicing, and public sector emoluments. President from the North, what does it change? Does it change that? President from the North, does it change that? President from the East, does it change that? So the time has come for us to begin to look at merit. The time has come for us to look at the ideas which are being thrown at us and to see whether these can lead to a significant and better change in our fortunes. Okay? The time has come not just to measure expectation, but also to reshape expectation. And I give this advice free of charge. Free of charge. I'm going to give some advice. I hope it will be listened to. You see, my good friend ABA Fuseni. <laughs> Today I didn't hear many of your proverbs. I'm not sure whether you are running out of proverbs. <laughs> But it will be a disaster if you run out of Proverbs. Master, listen to me very carefully. I'm hearing so much about 24-hour economy. But nobody is trying to focus on our mind on what the 24-hour economy will really mean from 2024. What would it really mean? How can we touch 24-hour economy in 2024? What are the things that when we see, we should come to the conclusion that yes, we have 24-hour economy? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So at midnight, if I wake up and my sandals, the, the souls have given way, if I go to Malata, and I can't get new sandals to buy, would that be a failure of the 24-hour economy? Mm. Masa, are you listening to me? I am. I am. So at 3 a.m., if I wake up and I want to eat two zafi, and I go to East Lego and I don't get two zafi to eat, would the 24-hour economy have succeeded or failed and so on? So beyond making the promise, we need to be told in real concrete terms what it would look like, what it will be. You understand what I'm saying? Because otherwise, expectations run wild. And people make their judgments on the basis of their personal expectations, which may be completely unfounded, but there's no other. So everybody comes up with a conjecture of their own about what it is going to be like. Now, this is not just about the 24-hour economy. It's about all policies which have been promised by all the parties, by all the actors. There's too much glibness, 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 glibness. Let's move beyond the glibness. And let's create a reality. 
Because if you do not create a concrete reality, caricatures will be created for the population. And the people will make their judgments on the basis of the caricatures which are created. This is free advice. Okay? Now, there's something else which is interesting. One of the things that Professor Jainana Opokwajiman said, which received the loudest applause, sitting at home watching television, my impression was that he got the loudest applause, was when she said that those who have messed up hmm, with public funds and so on, hmm, they will be made to account. And that it is not a threat, it is a promise. You saw how the room was electrified. To be honest with you, I talked to many people. Everybody is expecting that. Everybody is expecting that. Masa, in the end, this is worse. What? What they want to do to these people who, 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 who they think have stolen? You can't believe it. So, Professor Jenna Pokwajiman captured the sentiment. But you see, December 7th, 2025, she will not be at the inauguration of a running mate. She will be sworn in as vice president of the republic. That's a huge difference. That's January 7th. January 7th, yes, yes, yes. You know, yeah, sorry, thank you. You understand? That's a huge difference. Initially, it would be fun. People would applaud, catch them, jail them, and so on. Ultimately, in three months after being sworn in, that is not what is going to be important. What is going to be important is the price of petrol. What is going to be important is the price of kinky. What is going to be important is whether people are able to send their children to school or not. So while pursuing the objective of accountability is important, pursuing the objective of probity and accountability is important, a lot more focus has to go on the realization of the aspirations of our people. Master, people are fed up. You know better than me. Senna, you, I listen to your program every day. People are fed up. People are losing hope in the political establishment. And if the NDC is elected to form the government, their focus should be more on the solution of the problems that confront the ordinary people of this country than on jailing people. Take it from me. Jailing people initially will get a lot of applause. But it won't last beyond three months. After three months, we'll be counting costs. We'll be looking into our pockets. We'll be testing our standard of living and so on. So a lot more focus ought to go into how to resolve the concrete problems that confront our people. And those problems are many. They are numerous. People have lost hope in the political establishment. Now, there's something else which is bothersome. You see, since February 24th, 1966, we've only had a very short period huh, that we've tried to move away from the new liberal order. And that short period is between January 13, 1972 and sometime in 1975, when we came up with a new policy of national self-reliance leading to the promulgation of policies like operation feed yourself and feed your industries 
leading to questioning of our national indebtedness, leading to an emphasis on the need for a paradigm shift. As soon as the first palace coup occurred, we quickly returned to the neoliberal order. Okay? And we have stayed on the neoliberal order from that time till today. The consequences have been disastrous for this country and everybody. The fact that today we are importing fish, we are importing guinea fowls from Denmark, we are importing cocoa yam, we are importing plantain, we are importing bottled water, and so on. These are consequences huh, of staying on that path of neoliberalism, and so on. Now, unfortunately for me, so far, in this campaign season, nobody has given us the option of abandoning the path of neoliberalism. Nobody. We are still stuck on the path of neoliberalism. And that's a huge problem. Because if you are stuck there, your national economy will be run by the transnational corporations. They will run your national economy for you. Occasionally, you will go back to the IMF and the World Bank, and they will tell you not to subsidize agriculture, whereas the United States, Canada, and all of them are subsidizing their agriculture. You cannot be competitive on the world market. You understand? So when are we going to move from the path of neoliberalism to the path of national self-reliance, which require the total mobilization of every and anything Ghanaian for the purpose of solving the problems that I listed from the very beginning? That is our situation. The other thing that I'm not hearing about is a deliberate focus on security. There's no deliberate focus on security. Nobody's addressing it. But it's a major problem. Why is it a major problem? You take Nigeria. Hmm? One out of 16 countries in the West Africa sub-region. Nigeria alone has a population of 260 million people. More than half the total population of West Africa. And I've said this many times. You go to Nigeria today, you have Boko Haram insurgency in the Northeast. You have the low intensity civil war in the Niger Delta area. You have a secessionist movement in the East and so on. If Nigeria blows apart, the whole of West Africa blows apart. We know of the, of the insurgency that is sweeping across the West African region. In fact, three days ago, we actually heard about rebel attacks in Benin, in the center of Benin, and so on. The northern border of Togo has been attacked. La Côte d'Ivoire is in the crosshairs. Ghanaian intelligence shows us. If Ghanaian intelligence is true, then this is true. That the insurgents have sleeping cells in our country. And that the speculation is that they have come down south of Tamale, and so on. That's a major problem. You can have the best of ideas. And so, but if you are confronted with this kind of insurgency, your ideas cannot be implemented. What plans do we have for containing this insurgency? I haven't heard anybody speak about it. You understand? I haven't heard anybody speak about it. Now, what is the contribution? The contribution of, of, of the swarm of Western intelligence and Western militaries in West Africa to this crisis. Now, they are everywhere. The Americans are everywhere. The British are everywhere. The French are everywhere. The Kotoka International Airport has become the logistic hub of the US Armed Forces. 
Who is examining that? And its consequences for us? Are we going to retain these foreign military bases on our soil? There must be a policy. Unless, of course, all of our leaders are afraid of Uncle Sam. Hmm. So it's a matter that they rather not talk about. You have U.S. military presence on your soil. It is part of the problem. Before the Burkina coup, 60% of the area of Burkina Faso was controlled by so-called Islamic insurgents. It can happen anywhere in West Africa today. Especially as we now do know that the insurgents are looking for a route to the Atlantic Ocean. How do they get to the Atlantic Ocean? The only way they get to the Atlantic Ocean is by sweeping across Ghana, Togo, Benin, and La Côte d'Ivoire. You understand? So what is our position? I am ashamed as a Ghanaian. Really, really ashamed as a Ghanaian. You know why? Because genocide is happening under our eyes in Palestine. Genocide. Naked genocide. Our president has declared that his government and Ghana stand firmly with Israel. Of course, the president does not speak for me. I don't stand firmly with Israel. He does not speak for me. But one would have expected that the others will be making statements on the situation in Palestine. I'm sorry, I'm winning and some are a course of our high winners. So, a year, Kwesi Pratt, and a day and some are about to draw or chess. A Jen Nana or Poku Ajima or no name pa or his head. Say a yes or did John Dramani Mahamed Chia and yet as some Ketua cry. The very average of us is a homage for me. Coco Tisa, Odue, a day, a my aha, a P. O. G. Media, Madame Massa.